we'll see if this eventually works. What's that? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> well, repetition is always important, right? Okay, and we are repeating this class a lot. I don't know, some of you may have taken the class a long time ago when I first did it, but uh, we took a little extra time on veracity. I think everybody wanted to do that, and so we, all right. So I did put some notes, uh, kind of review, and I didn't ask a big question. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but, you know, the, we can't forget. We've got to we got to remember, number one, when we teach veracity, and this is what I would, I would expect every, every professor, every class, every time you have history, you know, I told you, historians don't study history through history books. I know they handed you a history book and said, here's the truth, read it, right? But how do you know history? You gotta have primary sources, right? And all historians always go for primary sources. They don't go for tertiary sources, which are history books. And even I'm sad to say, my, you know, I wrote a couple of novels. I write historical novels. My historical novels are tertiary sources, even though the history is good in them. So I still think they're fun to read because they give you a uh, look into the history that you may not have if you try to read a primary account, which I don't know if you read a lot of primary accounts, but some of them can be... You know, some are autobiographies that are exciting and some are not. That's the way the world is. But historians always look at that. And when you teach history, you've got to look at veracity. And so we concluded that based on the bibliographical, the internal and external tests, that the Torah was at least as good as, right? But there, because of the history of the Jewish people, it had some very positive characteristics that were different that you don't find in other ancient texts. Mainly, the um, Safars and eventually the Masoretes. So you had groups of people that were ensuring the transmission of the documents through time. You don't see that in any other source. So this is what is key to that. The question I want to ask, and you know, um, I'll just pose it, this is a completely non-theological question, it has a theological kind of end point to it. But why do you think they don't teach the legal historical method or rational logic in school anymore? The teachers don't understand, I, I agree with that, the teachers, because they weren't taught, but they used to teach this at the turn of the 20th century. Why don't they teach it today? I think that's part of it, but I think the real reason is if I were to ask the questions of veracity of, for example, the documents that I brought into the classroom from the collegiate level down to the high school level, what does that immediately lead you to a conclusion of? That the Old Testament and New Testament, I hate to say that, the documents of the Old Testament and New Testament are accurate historical documents of an equal basis or better, and the New Testament is ten times better, the Old Testament is at least as good. Do you see a problem for modern, godless education? Because if I have to breach that subject, what is the immediate conclusion? That they're accurate. And therefore, if they're accurate, you have, to do, you have to do something about that, right? So I think, based on what we studied, we can start right now with the Torah as an accurate historical representation, at least those that are primary and secondary sources. Remember, it's always, is it primary or secondary? Secondary is hearsay, but we can accept that in history, although you can't accept that in a court of law or any kind of judicial action. Hearsay is just not considered legal. Uh, however, that's the point. So, with that, and then I, al I also want to remind you, and you know, repetition is something we always have to do, I'm sorry, so if this is just repetitive to you, 
Remember, in English, we write. How do we write in English? How are we supposed to write in English? Intro, body, conclusion. Intro, body, conclusion. Intro, body, conclusion. That's the way English speakers are taught to write. If you don't know how to write that, Jan used to be in her class, and she would confirm this every time. That's what she tried to teach her unruly students or ruly students. Intro, body, conclusion. We learned Greek, right? We did Greek and Hebrew. How does Hebrew written? Did I say the right thing? Greek? Hebrew. You said Hebrew. Oh, did I say Hebrew? Yeah. Hebrew is, yes. Synopsis body. You're right. Synopsis body. And I wanted to point out that Greek is logos to tell us. Yeah, unstated tell us, right? Tell us. Unstated tell us. And the reason this is important is because, as I mentioned, and I'll keep mentioning it, if you interpret or if you look at the Old Testament, not the Torah, as an intro body conclusion, how is it going to work out? You're done. You're going to have to rewrite some things. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're, you're, something's not wrong, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, professors and professorates, instead of rewriting it, what do they do? Say, oh, there's multiple versions of it. Yeah, they make up something. Like I said, if, if you show me the document, show me the document, show me the historical cue. I want to see cue. You guys know what cue is, right? Q is a supposed source of the, the synoptic gospels. There is no Q. There never has been. It was made up. It's made up. He's made it up. So where are the documents of the separate Torah sources for the different um, accounts, historical accounts? They don't exist. They're made up. So, you know, this is the way it works. That's why veracity is so important. If you, if you had veracity in the universities, what would you conclude? If somebody said, there's got, to be, there's got to be another document, there's got to be other sources, what would you say? Where is it? Yeah, where is it? What's wrong with you? Are you nuts? Right? You, in, in science, I don't just make up metachlorians, right? How many metachlorians are there out there, right? I don't just make up stuff in science and then apply it to the world. That's silly. In the same way in history or in documents, we don't just make up stuff, right? So you have to have a basis. And so if you understand why and how things are written in different languages, especially ancient documents, then you can understand them. So this is kind of the basis. Now, um, I kind of have a review of grammar here because we kind of really have to do it. Um, let's see. I should have put this on your paper, but I thought there was more important things to look at before we start looking at the specifics of the um, names of God. But, okay, so let's, let's talk about parts of speech. You, you hate this, right? Parts of speech. Parts of speech. So we have first person, right? First person, part of speech. And we have single and plural. Okay, I'll, I'll try not to make too much of this, but I have... In English, let's see, what do we call them? We call them subject. It's actually the nominative. We have the, um, the subject, the object, let's see, the predicate, the predicate, the predicate. That's the accusative case. We have the object of the predicate, object, which is the dotted case, and then we have the um, possessive. And the possessive is called a genitive case. In, in other, when you study language. Okay, so, first person singular in English in, is what? In the pronoun. Remember? First person singular? First person singular? I, I. I. Yes, I. Okay? First person accusative. You. First person. Me. 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 First person object predicate, native. Okay. Me. Me. Possessive case. Mine. Mine. Very good. You guys are great. Excellent. Okay. Plural. We. 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 Plural. Us. 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 Ours. Ours. Beautiful. Okay. Second person. Singular or plural? You. 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 Y'all. You, 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 y'all. And then this one's on y'all's 
of an apostrophe. Yours. 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 Right? Okay. Okay, how about plural? All y'all. Plural. All y'all. It's the same in plural, right? Okay. How about third person? Singular. He and she. She. It. it. Okay. How about um, how about the accusative case, the predicate? Him. 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 Her. And it. How about the dotted case, the object of predicate? Same. Him, her, it. Same. And how about uh, possessive? His, hers, and yeah. it. This, hers, it. Um, this is why there is no such thing as gender in regards to sex or animals. There is only gender in regards to language. Because in language you have masculine, feminine, and, non, and, and a neuter case. The reason is because why? Most languages in English used to, Anglo-Saxon used to have masculine, feminine, and neuter nouns. What are ships always called? She. she. Well, in classic English. Because in Anglo-Saxon, it's the last one, the last remaining ones. Hurricanes were also a she, but they took that away. I don't know, they, they neutralized it. But this, this is where confusion comes in in teaching. Because teachers used to teach this, and now people are absolutely confused about it. So this cracks me up. Okay, in the plural, we have, what's the plural for the third person? They. 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 Them. <coughs> them. Them. And theirs. This is called the basic pronoun matrix. This is what you learn. If you're studying a language, this is called a pony. And this is what you set up as a pony for a, a language. And this is, the reason this is important is because, well, <laughs> it is important, but it seems like our culture has forgotten all of its language and pronoun use. But the reason it's really important is because there is a significant point of this that is not used in ancient languages. And that is this, the singular nominative, and, and usually the whole of the singular is not, not used except in very declarative cases in English in ancient languages. This is true of Hebrew, and this is true of Greek. So for example, the construction in Hebrew that we would, you know, that in English is I am, I am. We'll talk about that today. <coughs> this is not used in normal speech. This construction is not used. In Greek, it's ego imi, ego imi, and ego imi is not used in standard speech. This, what, what we miss in, and I'll just point this out, in the, for example, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ talks calls himself ego imi multiple times. When he does that in Greek, what should you do? You should really take notice because he is making a declaratory <coughs> statement. That's why whenever he said it, especially in John, he makes like basically seven, I think, ego imi statements in John. When we say John, we saw this. And what, they, what that means in Greek is basically he is making a singular Singular declarative statement. That's why when Pilate said to him, are you the son of God? And he goes, or are you the king of the Jews? And he goes, ego imi. He was making a declarative statement that yes, he was the king of the Jews. In Hebrew, it's a similar type usage. Now, I don't know exactly why. Linguists aren't sure why the I am statements are so common in modern languages, but not in ancient languages. Maybe it was obvious. Maybe your status, your, your person, who you were, was so obvious in those languages where they were not as obvious in modern language. I don't know.
no. But it's an important point to make. So the whole point of this is, number one, the criticality in ancient languages of this statement of ego imi. And you notice it's the first person singular form. All these other forms are used. As a matter of fact, in Greek, what we find is we find when someone wants to say, and we find similar things in Hebrew, when people want to say a declaratory statement, they do it with a dative phrase or an accusative phrase. In other words, they use me instead of using I. So this, I know this seems kind of, um, what do you call it, digging into the weeds, but it is really important to understand it because of what we're going to get to in a moment. The other thing that I, and you know, I, okay, I don't, I just want to remind you of these parts of speech because they are really, really important in understanding where we're going and understanding what the Torah is telling us. So let's look at verbs. These are verbs. Okay, in the verbs, we have uh, first person, and we have plural, we have singular, we have plural, we have second person, we have singular and plural, and we have third person, and we have singular and plural. And then we have, um, uh, we, don't, we don't have, we have the present tense, let's see, where am I starting? The present tense, present, we have the past, we have the, what's called the perfect. <laughs> do you remember this stuff? And we have the future tense. I won't do the plus plum perfect, but I'll do the future. The, we have also the, what's the, um, uh, we have the uh, what's that? Present, perfect. present perfect tense. Yeah. So we won't do that. We'll sit, stick with the simple stuff. Okay. First person present. I've been getting it to you. I am. Am. Okay, we'll go down this way. Okay, first person plural. We are. are. Okay. Second person. You are. You are. Are. Uh, and are. And are. And are. And are. Let's see, I think in the third person. Um, third person. Uh, Person. He is. He is. Yep, he is. He is singular. And then are. Okay? Past tense. Was. Was. Let's see how many was do we have. Uh, was and then were. were. You were. were. Uh, plural. You were. were. Uh, third person. Was. was and were. were. Okay, perfect tense. Has been. Has been. Okay, it's, it, yeah, we call it helpers. So it's, it's actually a verb case. Um, okay, and they, we, we have been. Okay, and then let's see, are we, are we all have been, have been, have been? They're all have been. So they're all the same. Okay, and how about this one? This one's easy. Future, I will be. Will be. And it's all the same. Now, the point of this is, okay, when we see a plural verb, we know we are talking in, for example, first person. We know we are talking about a plural, a plural noun, right? When we see a singular, we know we're talking about singular. In other languages, this is much more complex, but in English, we've lost a lot of the thing. And just as a side note, okay, so to fit with what we want to talk about today, how about we use, the am is a special case verb, it has to be an Anglo-Saxon verb, it's a verb of um, identity. So let's use create, okay? So I create. As a matter of fact, all of these are the same. You, you create, we create, right? Past tense. Created. 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 Okay? And then a dative. Have created. Have created. 
Yeah, you're you're getting into uh, that's that's. Uh, that's, that's, no, I'm not giving all the tense cases in English. The tense cases in English are really complex, so we're not going to go through all of them. Future will create. And they are not, I know we love to call these helper verbs, but they are not helper verbs. They are verb forms. So, you know, but I'm not here to teach English. Anyway, the big deal is that in understanding what the Hebrew is telling us, we don't need we need to remember our English so that when we look at the Hebrew, we can see it within the context. Now, so, with this basis, let's ask this very important question. Why are the names, and maybe you don't care or know until today, but why are the names of God important? Pick some names of gods, just for fun. Of it. So, that's God. well, that, let, let's pick like non, Zeus. non like Zeus. Yeah, Zeus. Okay, Zeus. That's a great one. How do you know? No, how do you know? Where did it come from? How do they know? We read it in a book. Well, somebody, somebody wrote it down. Well, how'd they get it? What's the etymology of the word? We're not sure. It's, it, is, it is a proper noun, a proper name, but it's like Socrates. Why did his parents name him Socrates? I don't know, but who named Zeus? Well, nobody knows. How about Shiva? Shiva's great. Okay, Shiva. How do we know? Um... Allah. Um, Allah. It just means God in Arabic. Oh. So they yeah. took it from Christianity. Okay, how about Kami? Kami. Kami is a generic word meaning God in Jap Japanese. What I do is I put anything ahead of Kami and it's a God. So, and I'm not making fun of it, it's animism. Miki Kami. Miki Kami. Um, what do they call the God of Gods? Um, Kami, Kami something. Anyway, Kami is just a name of God. And so you put anything, as a matter of fact, remember when, when I was reading to you the documents from Japanese stuff? How did we know they were gods? Because they were Miki no Kami, you know, Miki no Am Kami, or whatever. A lot of them are named for, for example, places. Um, Delphi, right? Delphi does not have a specific god, but there are gods that resided in Delphi. And so you would say Zeus or Apollo of Delphi, just like you'd say Jesus of Nazareth, right? Because he came from Nazareth. So the point that I'm trying to make here is, as we look at the names of God, what makes, what makes Hebrew and the Torah significantly different than any other culture, language, document, or anything in the whole world. The Lord God Almighty told Moses his name. Okay, how many other how many other documents in the world literature claim this? Need me to tell you? Zero. 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 No documents in history of the world have told us. For example, when Muhammad got his revelations from God, from Allah, what did Allah say his name was? He did. When Morani gave Joseph Smith, the tablets. Who did, what did he say the name of God was? He said God. God, and, and here's a problem I think we have. Did you know that our God has a name? Why don't you use it? We don't use it. Isn't that interesting? Well, here we go. Let's look. Let's look at the words, the names for God. So what I did is I 
I didn't do every, we'll talk about some others generally, but specifically the very, very, very first name we, we meet in the Old Testament at the very beginning, and I didn't quote, do I have a quote? Um, yeah, 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 let's see. Well, we know. At the very beginning, it says, in the beginning, oh, I we need to stop there because that's not what it says, but we'll see what it says. But this L, L is means in Hebrew, just generally, God. This is God, and it's singular, singular. So we expect God, singular, to take what kind of verb? Singular. A singular verb. So, for example, in English we'd say God is, right? The word Elohim, and let's see, do I have any other thing? Uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give you the details. I don't know if I gave you all the details in your sheet, but um, it's most correctly pronounced. It's not, it's not pronounced El, it's pronounced Eloah, Eloah. It's shortened to L. It means a deity, any deity. It, it, it doesn't necessarily, it could mean any god, for example. So the shortened form L here, it comes from the, it, the way this word came about. It's etymology in Hebrew is it comes from the word strength, strong, basically chief, you know, powerful, mighty. Um, it comes from a root to twist, and that the implication being to be of strength. So that's the etymology of the word. And this is a word like English, okay, or in Islam, right? So the word Allah means God. The word God in English, where do we get God? Where did that come from? It's Anglo-Saxon. It's an Anglo-Saxon word. We just That's the word we always use, right? And all the gods of the Anglo-Saxons I mean they were, they're called God, right? They all have names. Um, Elohim, this is God's. And so we would expect God's to take what kind of verb? Right? God's are. Right? And we can see, let's see, God, God creates. God's create. You can see it in English, right? You can see the difference in the verb usage based on plural or singular. So, here's without a qualifier or determinant. And what I mean by that, a qualifier or determinant, um, when, when in, if you, now you got to go look, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but if you look in your Hebrew Bible, if you look in your Torah, right, when you see, how do I explain this? Okay. Remember how I told you that in um, uh, hieroglyphics are rebus. Are, they're, re they're rebuses, right? They are, for example, um, this is a rebus. I, I love uh, you. I guess that's okay, rebus, right? That's a rebus, and that's the way hieroglyphics work. Hieroglyphics are relatively uncomplex. Their, their sentence structure and their structure is a rebus structure. The problem is, remember I told you, they don't include any um, vowels. There are no vowels in hieroglyphics. There are no vowels in Hebrew. So how do we fix, for example, if I wrote in hieroglyphics, H-T, how do I know that word is a hat? Context, but what I do in hieroglyphics is I put a determinant next to it. That's why in he in hieroglyphics, and this is what confused people forever, is you'll find the word and then you'll find a determinant. So, for example, if the word is uh, H R T, how do I know that's a heart? I'll put a, a human determinant, a man determinant, which doesn't look like a man, but it's a hieroglyphic for man the man-shaped hieroglyphic. So what happened in hieroglyphics is hieroglyphics can be read, but they're really difficult to read because you have to know, and usually they put the determinants up 
a uh, subscript or a superscript. This is the way it works. So look at, don't try to read the hieroglyphics or hurt your head, because it's, remember, in Egyptian, it's not in English. But what they do in, what the problem they have in, um, in Hebrew is Hebrew is like this, but what do they don't not have? They don't have determinants. So the way you have to understand them is, remember I told you, hieroglyphics are for reading, but all writing, Socratic script in hieroglyphics, erratic script in hieroglyphics, and Hebrew script is what? It is mnemonics. They're memorized. You don't need the determinants because you have memorized the text. You know the context, right? So is it, here's a question, is it possible to read cold Hebrew form? No. It has to be, you have to memorize it with someone. Someone has to memorize it for you. Unless you're past 800 AD, and after 800 AD, then you have the vowel points, and then you can figure it out as long as they're right. Remember, some of them we found were a little bit wrong. Not many, but a few. So this is really important to note. So as we go <coughs> on, here's, here's an example of and what I do. Okay, so in a, in a Hebrew, I don't have Hebrew determinants. So how do I... How do I, in their language, specify a different God, a different God? Uh, they don't have that. Uh, also, <laughs> something like a God in front of it instead of the God? Or... There are problems, too, kind of ish. What I do is I would say, for example, L, L of Delphi, right? That would tell you that it is a god of the Greeks, right? And here's an example. So I've got it here. In English, uh, Canaanite god was El, whose son was Baal. And, it, and it, here's, this is Deuteronomy 5, 9. I, the Lord, and we'll get to that, your god am a jealous god. Uh, so I, the Lord, um, well, I don't want to get there yet. Well, I guess I will. I, the Lord, Jehovah, your god, Elohim, am a jealous god. L. I, the Lord Jehovah, your Elohim, your gods, am a jealous L, God. Abraham, in the name of the Lord Yahweh, the everlasting El Olam. El Olam. So here we have El Olam. Anyone notice what El Olam is? I put it on the first page uh, of, the, of the first notes I gave you. The, the Hebrews have two words for time, yom, yom, and olam. Olam means eternity. So el olam is the everlasting or eternal God. Um, so that's a, that's a determinant, right? They use a word to describe God. Now, this still applies to, apparently, to God, right? Because Abraham's talking about God. It could be, but remember, Abraham believed in the Canaanite moon gods, right? Until God called him out. So it's interesting. Why do you think? Why do you think Abraham might call God El Olam to distinguish him from the others? Because remember, the word El is just generally God. Right? Um, in, let's see, this is um, Genesis 32, 28, and 33, and 33, 20. Jacob commemorating his wrestling with the angel, the place he called Peniel. 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 Literally, the place of God. So then, a determinant to determine a place. Um, Receiving his new name, Israel. We don't think about this, right? All right, let's see. Israel. His name means literally God strives. Yes, sir. It's an observation to all the archangel names end in L. Gabriel, Uriel, Lagiel. Uh-huh. They do. Um, what? should that tell you? Well, I, I think 
that's, Tammy says, right, they're demigods. They are, okay, I know we don't think of terms of gods and demigods, but the people of this time, what they, did they do? They did, they thought about it this way. You know, Abraham, when he specified Elohim, was specifying because he was separating the god of God, right, they called him, from the goddess of the moon. You see what I'm saying? So, you, we have a, that's exactly right. We don't think in terms of demigods, but I think that what we have to do is we need to roll back our way of thinking back to what these early people are thinking. Remember, they come out of animism, to pantheonic paganism, to mysterion, to Gnosticism. There's no inkling of mysterion right now. They are moving from animism, where they have everything as a god, right, that moves everything in the world, to the idea of pantheonic paganism. That comes with literacy. So they're, you know, we need to understand where they are coming from. We have, how about this? El Shaddai. El Shaddai. I should have sung that song today. El Shaddai, God Almighty, signifying God as a source of blessing, is a name which God appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's in Exodus 6, 3. Whenever you see the suffix El in a Hebrew word or name, it indicates God, and it's usually translated God in English. All right, we're moving on. So Elohim. Elohim is the plural of El. It means gods. So, usually translated, what is it usually translated? You know what it's, okay, El is usually translated in English as God. God, that's it. When you see it in the Bible, what is Elohim usually translated as? Capital. Very good. G-O-D. God. Isn't that interesting? Well, let, let's see. I think I've got the context here. I think I put it on. Oh, did I have the context? Oh, my goodness. The context. Okay. In the beginning. In the beginning. In the beginning. Capital, look in your Bible. It says a capital God. What is the word? In the beginning, uh, Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim. And then you don't have it, but what do you think the verb is? It's a singular verb. In the beginning, God's, and we don't have the verb, but it's his. And then it says, in the beginning, God's create. Use a singular verb. Now this shouldn't bother anyone. The next step it says, in the beginning gods create, singular verb, and the ruach of God, the spirit of God, rested on the face of the waters, and God amar. All right. Was the God in that place hell also? No. Elohim. It's a capital G. It's Elohim. The thing, okay, okay, people, here we go. C.S. Lewis, on to C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis probably described God the best in the whole world. He is not like water, which is, you know, frozen, melt, and steam. God is a four dimensional being. Four dimensional being. So therefore, he resides. What, what is the fourth dimension? Time. God is a four-dimensional four being projected into a three-dimensional world. We live in a three-dimensional world that time is time moves. God sees time all at once because he's a four-dimensional being. This isn't just C.S. Lewis. This comes from Augustine. So all that stuff that you guys, you know, that we all forgot and we all maybe didn't read when we were supposed to read it, but our teachers were telling us about, right, when we were in school. All that cool stuff. Augustine wrote a treatise on time, and in his treatise on time, he says God is outside of time. He did not have the words for a four-dimensional being, but that's what he was describing. God is a four-dimensional being. So, and I, it's hard to draw this correctly, okay? But can you, okay, if I draw a, a three-dimensional structure, in, this, is, this is two dimensions, right? And I draw a three-dimensional st 
structure in two dimensions, how many projections does it have? Three. Well, it has three because I am projecting it as in, a, in two dimensions I only have width and I have height, right? And you're correct. This, oh, this has height and it has width and it has depth. It's projected. It's projected. You see this? You can't fully comprehend it, but you can see it. I can't draw you a four-dimensional being in a third dimension. But if you did have a four-dimensional being in a third dimension, I got to note this. What is the real dimensions of this? How many? Two. It only has two dimensions, but it has the appearance of three, right? In a four-dimensional being projected into a three-dimensional world has how many projections? This is this is has one has projections in two dimensions, but it's a this is a three-dimensional representation. representation. Yeah, projected in two dimensions. So if I have a four-dimensional being projected into three dimensions. How many faces does it have? Three. Three faces. Read C.S. Lewis. I don't have time to go into his thing. It's an argument. It's a whole book. It's mere, I think it's mere Christianity. Beautiful explanation from physics. But the big deal is that when God first states to Moses, right, the first thing we see is God tells us God's with the singular. And then explains that I have, I have gods in the singular. And I'll put it like that, just like the we translated. Then I have the Ruach Hakodesh, the Holy Spirit, and then I have the Amar. The Amar. What's the Amar? In Greek, Amar is translated logos. You remember what it says in John? In the beginning. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and God spoke the Word. Guess what? The Septuagint says, in the beginning, Theos, and the, um, the, the Hagios, the Panuma, rested on the waters, and God, Logos. The point is this. When we talk about God, right? We're talking about a four-dimensional being in three dimensions. What are the three faces of God in our world? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I mean, this should be obvious stuff, easy stuff. The Hebrews, whether they completely accept that or not, the Jewish people, it is written in their words. Okay? It is written in their points. And so what we have is we have, if you were God, and you were trying to express yourself to People, even to us. What would you do? I, I don't know, maybe, maybe all, all of us are ready to understand, you know, four-dimensional beings in a three-dimensional world. But I tell you what, they weren't. They didn't have no idea. They had no idea, right? Could they keep time? Barely. Could they, could they even understand the concept of multiple dimensions? Barely. I mean, they understood, you know, height, breadth, and width. They weren't stupid. They were very, very, very smart people. But they didn't have the tools that we have today that we fumble with, right? We have wonderful tools to know these things. And they didn't. So God is trying to express to them. And you see how perfect? How perfect is this expression? I mean, to me, this is like, you go, boing. I mean, you could take those three verses at the beginning of Genesis, and you could write a whole book about it. It's just so phenomenally powerful about who God is, right? And so we start with this. This is when you read your Bible, when you read the Torah, okay, not about when you read the Torah, it's not the Torah, when you see God, this is El. When you see a capital with God, it is Elohim. It means gods. And when it says gods, it is representing Holy Trinity. It's, it's basically representing the Holy Trinity. If you want to talk in Jewish talk, it's representing the, three dimen the four dimensional God in three dimensions. I like that because that's, that cuts across everybody, right? Who do you worship? I worship a four dimensional God. I worship the God, right? Not just any God, 
right? It's the Elohim God. What a cool thing. Anyway, let's go on. So now, um, Jehovah. What I did is I, I should have written for you the Hebrew. And I, I always I have to grab it every time I want to get it because I can't remember. I, look, I'm, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I don't claim to be. I know Greek. I can do Greek pretty easily. I'm not a Hebrew kind of guy. So you give me a Greek word, I can write it out. But you give me a Hebrew word, I've got problems. I'm not a, I haven't practiced the, the Hebrew you know, um, consonants my whole life. So I wrote it in English for you. Y-H-W-H. This is what you will see when you read the Torah in Hebrew if you translate it into the English consonants. This means, it's, a, it's basically a variation, I got the thing here, of uh, Jehovah from, um, it means literally, I am. Remember when I, I thought, I said, you know, I've got to look at verb forms and I've got to look at personal pronoun forms. Because if you don't understand this, you won't get it. These forms are not used in ancient languages, especially Hebrew and Greek, unless they are specifically declarative. So this word, this is I am. So let me go back to the see. Um, <clears throat> Moses in the burning bush. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am. Okay, let me point this out to you. Remember I first started and I said, look at all these gods. What do you do when you introduce your, if you are a real person and you introduce yourself to someone, what is the first thing that you do? Tell them your name. <laughs> Tell them your name. Okay. I will posit to you that you can look at every piece of religious literature in the world, and there is only one piece of literature, the Torah, in which a god ever tells you his name and introduces it to you. In every, every other case, what, it, what happens? For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, how do you know it's that, that guy is a god? Somebody told you his name, and, and the presumption was he was that name. In Hebrew, they do the same thing, right? If it has an L at the end, the presumption is not necessarily they're a god, but that they're named after a god, or a place is named after a god. Just like in Japanese thought, right? If I put kami on the end, it's a god, or it reflects to a god or a place. You see what I'm saying? In Hebrew, in the Torah, Moses had this guy, a four-dimensional being, and it's projected into third dimension, three dimensions, he says to Moses in Exodus 3.14, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me. Not George, not Harry, not Jimmy Bob. I am. The reason this is important is because did you ever use the statement, I am, in Hebrew? Never. Very rarely. The, the only time, like I said, it's probably, um, it's probably used even less than in Greek. As societies began to move toward, like I said, things were self-determining. Um, uh, that's hard to explain. But if, if I looked at you, if I looked at Brett and he's wearing male clothing, in a male thing, and he's wearing a certain type of class of clothing, I immediately know who he is. He doesn't have to tell me. I am the wealthy merchant, Brett. Right? Or, or if, if Dave is wearing, like, you know, a loincloth, and, you know, got his stuff tucked up, and he's carrying a hoe over his shoulder, he doesn't have to tell me, Hi, I'm Dave, the farmer. Right? Because you look at him. Now, all of us, how do I know who you are? How do I know what you do? Right? Uh, in our culture, because you don't dress or show your class like they did in the ancient cultures, I pretty much have to ask you. So linguistically, I said we don't know for sure, but this is one of the reasons they say why we don't use, or why ancient cultures don't use this. He, 
as, as I said, so Moses in the burning bush, already he disclosed himself to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob as, do you remember what he did? He disclosed himself to them as El Shaddai. El Shaddai. And why did we say that he would use that determinant? Huh? Well, El Shaddai, I think it means God of power. But the reason he... Why? Because they believed in other gods. And so the determinant was, you know, as we look through, we see, you know, I, I think it's a beautiful thing. If, if we, we're not going to go back and reread ourselves, but you should go back and reread, especially from the beginning to where we'll really start, you know, digging deep into this. We're going to look at the Adamic covenant. I need to get the covenants. But the big deal is that when, when, when God revealed himself to Abraham and Isaac and all those guys, he called himself El Shaddai. And the reason because there were a whole bunch of other elves. Do you know Paul believed in other gods? In the sense he didn't trust them or he wasn't convinced of them, but he believed that other gods existed. And matter of fact, Jesus did too, because what did Jesus do in his whole ministries? He was proving he was more powerful than other gods. Now, you say, did they exist? I don't know, but Jesus thought it was so important to express to the people the fact of his power over other gods that it was a critical impact or issue. I, I agree with that. That that is a good theological statement, but a bad historical statement. You see what I'm saying? I'm not I'm not picking on it. It's a great theological statement because we personally believe that there are no other gods than God, right? But guess what? If you are convincing the world, what do you have to do? You have to talk. Even today, right? There are other gods. Mammon, you know, pick, take your pick. You got mammon, you got intellectualism, you have Gnosticism, you have, you know, humanism, you got, you know, Allah and Shiva and all these other gods that people really believe in. So how do you approach them? I, you approach them like Paul did. What did Paul say? Hey, you've got all these gods, and here's an unknown god. Yeah, you have all these gods. But you know what? I'm going to bring to you the message of El Shaddai. Right? This is this has been the message through the whole of the Torah and the Gospels. Anyway, so Jehovah. Now, where do we get Adonai from? The set, the Jews interpret the second commandment as "Do not speak the name of God without a sufficient reason." What was the only sufficient reason to speak the name of God? The only time that the name of God was spoken aloud was when he, when the um, high priest pronounced the 118th Psalm during the uh, end of the Festival of Booths when they brought the water from um, uh, the, the, the water from the book, uh, the Pool of Shalom, the Pool of Shalom, the Pool of Shalom, they brought the water up and he would state the 118th Psalm which ends with, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. And he would say it. We know Josephus told us that he would go, Blessed is you comes the name of Yahweh. And so they lost the pronunciation of the word. They had no idea. It was only said one time in the temple in the whole year. And so that is when the Messiah was supposed to stand up and say, I'm here. And guess what? Jesus did that. That's what John tells us, and I think Matthew does too. So Well, I think it even goes deeper than that. The Orthodox Christians and the Orthodox Jews early on never said the name of God or Theos or Jesus. Well, they don't even write. They put G dash D. Yeah. They yeah. The, matter of fact, the, the Orthodox Jews go G dash D. But in if you go look at ancient Greek, instead of writing Theos, they wrote P 
P-H-S. And instead of writing Jesus, uh, I can't remember what it is, I'll do it in English, Jesus, they would write J-S-S. Because they did not pronounce the name of God. So the reason we, I think, do is because we've gotten this godly going. Yes? Wasn't that just because they didn't have vowels? No, no. The Greeks did have vowels. They intentionally pulled the vowels out. And we have values, vowels, but the Orthodox Jews don't put vowels in God. They pull them out because they do not want to speak, write, or say the name of God. Yes, ma'am. Um, isn't Shema, Israel, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, what, does it use Elohim in that? I know I have that later. Um, that in here someplace. Let me finish this. I believe um, I'll look that up. I'll, I'll look that up and make sure, but yes, sir. So who wrote JSS? I missed that. The Greeks, uh, the Greek Orthodox, or the, the Greek Christians, early Greek Christians would write, they wouldn't write Je they write Yeshua, but they would take the vowels out. They intentionally took the vowels out. Now, here's the point. If you take the vowels that are supposed to be in Yahweh, they are A-O-A-I, Adonai. The pronunciation in Hebrew is Adonai. So what you will see, what, what, when you read your Bible, when you read the Torah, what is Jehovah translated as? L-O-R-D in caps, all caps. When you see Adonai, what is it? Capital, uh, the L is capitalized. Yeah, but not the, all the yeah. other ones. Not the, all of the others. The point is that when a Jewish scholar read Yahweh, he would stop and he would read Adonai. He would read the vowels and not the consonants. He wouldn't read them together, right? This is really cool stuff. So, you know, I know we have to quit, but I'm sorry. There is so much to this, and we'll, I'll, I'll get the answer that you have. I thought I had it in my notes, but... You know, as we go forward, we've got to realize these cultural and textual differences. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll finish this next week, and then we'll get into covenants. Because we have to talk about covenants before we dig into covenants. And I'll probably I'll have it prepared, so we'll look at the Adamic covenant if we have time. But thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray you look after us this week. In the name of Christ.